Hello. It is Sunday. It's October 31st. Happy Halloween. And we are headed into module 10 of our online astronomy course. Now, as you can see from the background here, we have left the solar system and the sun behind, and we're going to start studying the stars. Now, I'll let you know that this is one of the more mathematical modules in the course, but I don't want you to worry about that because you've taken two tests by now, and you know I don't ask you any really difficult calculational problems on those exams. I do take you through some calculations on the homework quizzes because I want you to see how astronomers learn what they have learned about the stars. You know, the stars are so far away that there's no way we could learn about them by sending a rocket or a, a probe out to study the stars that way. They're just too far away. And so all we can do is look at the stars. We can look at the light from the stars. We can watch two stars perhaps as they move around each other with their gravity. But that's about all we can do. And so we have to get all the information about the stars remotely. And this module is gonna show you how that is done. And we've learned an awful lot about the stars. You know, one of the most basic things you can know about the stars is their distance. And to do that, astronomers use a common surveying technique called parallax. You know, if astronomers were looking at, I'm sorry, if surveyors were looking at a tree on the other side of a field, they wanted to know how far away that tree was, you know, they could just step it off. But what they do is they take a sighting on the tree. They stand at one location and they look at that tree and they look at, you know, in what direction do I have to look to see that tree? And then they move a known distance to another point and they take a sighting on that same tree and they say, okay, what angle do I have to look at to see that tree? And if they know the distance, between those two points they were looking at, they can figure out how far away the tree is. And the same thing works for the stars. We're going to look at a nearby star against the backdrop of much more distant stars. And we're going to look at nearby stars from two different widely separated positions. And about as far apart as we can get is looking at a star for when Earth is on one side of its orbit around the sun and when Earth is on the other side of its orbit around the sun. So the baseline is the distance across Earth's orbit around the sun. And we look at a nearby star from those two locations and we see that the position of that star shifts relative to the distant background stars. So let me show you how that works. We'll do a little interactive demonstration here. Um, I want you to pretend that the two positions you're going to look at a star from are your eyes. So if you close one eye, that other eye will be like looking at a star from one side of Earth's orbit. And if you close the other eye, that will be like looking at that star from the other side of Earth's orbit. Now, I want you to hold out your thumb and your thumb is going to be a nearby star. And I want you to line that thumb up with a distant star, something on the screen. And in fact, why don't you use my nose? So just hold out your nose, close one eye, either eye, doesn't matter which one. Just close one eye and then hold up your thumb have your thumb about halfway between my nose and the screen and just cover up my nose with your thumb. Go ahead, just cover up my nose. One eye is closed. Your thumb is right over my nose, okay? Now all of a sudden change eyes. Don't move your thumb. My nose hasn't moved, but your thumb is no longer covering my nose. In other words, this this foreground star, this nearby star, has moved relative 
to a distant background star. And that's called stellar parallax. And that's how we know the distance to the stars. We see how a star moves as viewed from one side of Earth's orbit and then viewed from the other side of Earth's orbit six months later. And that slight back and forth shifting, how much shifting that is, can tell us how far away the star is. And you know, it's only recently that we've had any idea at all how distant the stars are. And to show you that, I want to show you this book I have. Here we go. It's a really old book. I'll show you what it is. It's an introduction to astronomy. There we go. Introduction to astronomy. Maybe you can see the copyright down here. It's 1839. And if you take a look, how much of this um, book is about just our solar system? You know, if you were taking an astronomy course back in 1839, then how much of that book would be about just the solar system? And that is this much right here. That much of the book is about the solar system. And just this little bit here is about everything else, just the stars and the galaxies. And the reason I'm showing you this book is just to show you, I want to read you something from the book. Because this book was published in the year that Parallax was first discovered by a man named Bessel. And here they are. They're talking about the nature of the stars here, almost at the very end of the book. And it says that there's a little footnote that is put in. And the footnote says, very recent intelligence informs us that Professor Bessel of Koningsberg has obtained decisive evidence of an annual parallax in the star 61 Cygni amounting to 0 0.3136 arc seconds. Now you might remember that one degree is split into 60 parts and each one of those is an arc minute. And each arc minute is split into 60 parts. And one of those is one arc second. And so one arc second is one 3,600th of a degree. And the parallax to this star was, um, only about a third of an arc second. And the footnote goes on. This makes the distance of this star equal to 657, 700 times the distance to the sun. A distance it would take light 10.3 years to traverse. And that is the very first time we've ever known the distance to any star. So I think that is really pretty cool that just using common surveyor techniques that we've measured the distance to other stars. And uh, much more recently, in fact, just a couple of years ago, there was a Gaia satellite launched by the European Space Agency. And it determined the distance to a lot of the stars in our Milky Way galaxy and actually mapped up the Milky Way. So what else, is, what else can we know about the stars? Well, we can look at the light. And remember uh, back in an earlier module, we talked about black body radiation, that light that anything with a temperature above absolute zero gives off. We're going to learn about the black body radiation given off by stars. We'll learn how, to, how a model of a star is made so that the brightness of a star called the star's luminosity, how much energy it gives off per second. There's a relation between the star's luminosity, its radius, its size, and its surface temperature. And we'll learn all about that. We'll learn how the brightness of star is measured using a magnitude system and how the brightest star you can see with the naked eye other than the sun, of course, the brightest stars are first magnitude, all the way down to the faintest stars you can see with your naked eye, and those are six magnitude stars. So 
It's sort of weird. Higher number means a fainter star in the magnitude system. Uh, also, we'll look, be looking at the spectra of stars. We learned in an earlier module, module how atoms of different elements can emit or absorb light. I will learn how uh, people figured out the patterns that they saw of those dark absorption lines in stars' spectra, and they classified them. And so we come up with spectral types of stars. And, you know, it goes there, they were each given a letter. And during the course of all this through history, they really didn't know when they began what the spectra were telling us. And today we know that the spectra of a star can be used to tell the star's surface temperature, but they didn't know that. And so to get it in order of temperature, they had to rearrange the letters. And so today, the spectral sequence from hot to cold goes O, B, A, F, G, K, and M. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. Every astronomer knows that by heart. And quite often they've, they've memorized a little mnemonic, a little phrase to remember that. O, B, A, F, G, K, M. O, B, A, fine girl slash guy, kiss me. So if you can remember that little phrase, um, then you can remember the spectral sequence. We can gain even more information about the stars because if you've ever heard a train going by you at a railroad crossing, you know that if the train's blowing its horn and it's approaching you, the pitch of the horn is higher as it's, the train is coming nearer to you and then lower as the train moves away. And so you can just imagine how that might sound. So here's the train, it's over here and it's approaching you and the train is sounding its horn and it sounds like Do that again, I was practicing that. That change in pitch is called a Doppler shift. It's named after Christian Doppler, who first discovered it for sound and, and measured it for sound. But it also happens for light. For sound, it's caused by the moving source, the train, catching up with its own sound waves. And if stars are moving out in space, they are moving to catch up with their own light waves. So if a star is coming toward us, it's catching up with its own light waves, and the light, the light looks a little bit bluer if it's moving toward us. On the other hand, if the light is moving away from us, if the star is moving away from us, then the light is pulling away from its own light waves that stretches out the light waves and they look a little bit redder. And so you'll learn all about the Doppler shift. Bunch of cool stuff to learn about. And finally, you'll learn about how all that information is synthesized on the astronomer's best friend. It's a diagram. It has the star's brightness on a vertical axis, and it has the star's luminous, I'm sorry, the star's surface temperature on a horizontal axis. And so it goes this way, one way, and it goes that way, the other way. This way is luminosity, that way is surface temperature. And that was first done by uh, two people named Hertzsprung and Russell. So it's called a Hertzsprung-Russell or an HR diagram. And it synthesizes the information we have about stars and it allows us to pick up giant stars and super giant stars and then average stars like our sun and then little stars, dwarf stars like white dwarfs. And what's cool is, is that you can go out some night this week, and you can see a lot of those stars. So I want to share the screen and I want to uh, just pull up Stellarium here. There we go. Here's Stellarium. And this is for this Thursday night. This is December 4th. This is if you're outside at 10 at night. And this is the day of the new moon phase. So there's no moon in the sky. The moon is directly in the direction of the sun. So it's on the other side of the earth. Uh, moonlight's not gonna spoil your view. And here, just looking in the Southeast is the constellation of Orion. 
And there's some really cool stars here. The brightest star in Orion is Rigel. Down here, it's at the um, lower right-hand side of Orion. It's a blue-white. It's, it's just a normal giant star. It's about eight times as large as our sun is. Now, the second brightest star in Orion is Betelgeuse. Up here at the upper left, it is a red supergiant, and it is 800 times larger than the sun. In fact, if Betelgeuse is where the sun is today, we would be inside, Earth would be inside of Betelgeuse's surface. Mars would be inside of Betelgeuse's surface. That's how huge Betelgeuse is. And Betelgeuse is about 850 light years away. And in fact, a lot of the bright stars you see in the sky are bright and stand out, not because they are hot, but because they're so huge. So a lot of the stars you see in the sky are giant stars. Not all of them. We have some nearby stars. For instance, down here is Sirius. Sirius is the brightest appearing star in the sky because it's so close. Sirius is only about, oh, six light years away or so. And in fact, Sirius is a binary star. It's two stars orbiting each other. And one of those stars is the nearest white dwarf star to us. A white dwarf is a star about the size of Earth, but yet it has the mass of the sun. And Procyon over here is about um, 11 light years away. So these two stars are fairly close, but some of these stars in Orion are very far away indeed. So go out and take a look at the constellation of Orion. I'll be talking a lot about Orion because there's so much cool stuff going on in Orion. But this is a this is the module where you really get to find out what astronomy is all about, how we solve the puzzle of understanding what we're looking at when we go out into a night sky like I did a couple years ago in California and look at all these stars that are around us. I hope you enjoy learning about this and I hope that uh, if you have any questions, you can always ask, you can, you know, you can send me, uh, post something in the discussions, you can send me an email, we can set up a Zoom meeting, come on and see me in my office if you want. But until then, have a great week, and I will look forward to seeing you next week. So till then, bye-bye.